with it, and uh, we want you to want you to have it. Now, very quickly, uh, you know, I want you to pay close attention today, but uh, I'm going to uh, just check out the roll here and see the schools that we have. And when I mention the name of the school, uh, it's okay to make a little noise, okay? So uh, here we go. How about uh, Williamsburg? Oh, you can do better than that. How about Williamsburg? All right, now, how about Knox County Middle School? All right, very good. How about Wallens? And Oak Grove? All right, and last but not least, Whitley Intermediate. You're right up here on top of them. All right, well, thank you all. It's good to have you all here. Did I miss anyone, or is that out all the schools we have? Did I miss anyone? All right, great to have you here. Uh, again, uh, welcome to the University of the Cumberlands, and I'm going to turn uh, this microphone over to Don Shaw. He is the executive director of the uh, National Society of the Sons of the American Revolution. He's going to tell you more about the program and get us organized and get us on our way. Don? Now let's give Don a nice round of applause here. Well, first, first of all, welcome uh, on behalf of the National Society of Sons of the American Revolution. We're very honored to be here at the University of Cumberland, and so glad you guys could join us. Uh, I just want to say a few quick things because we do need to get you to your next, your first station right off the bat. I want to basically uh, remind you that uh, I want you to enjoy today, take in everything that you can from all the different sessions, and pay close attention because remember, at the end of the day, there's a little small quiz that we're going to be testing you on on things that we got said during each one of the sessions. So pay close attention. And then it just basically, again, uh, enjoy the trip through history. We're going to take a little quick journey through the 18th century. And uh, you're going to have an opportunity today to do something that the other groups have never gotten to do and see a document, an original document from 1774 that has never been displayed before other than in a few places in Alabama. We have these gentlemen up here with me or come up all the way from Alabama to share this with you. Uh, other than uh, outside of the National Archives in Washington, D.C., you probably will never get as close to a document like this than you will today. So enjoy it. It's something you probably can tell your children about in later years. For you adults, enjoy also. Everybody seated? Good. My name is Bill Stone. And I am a member of the Sons of the American Revolution. And uh, we, have, we have the honor and the privilege today to bring you a piece of American history and an American document that is extremely important to our country. It is one of the four national treasures of the United States of America. And it is called the Articles of Association of the First Continental Congress. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. I'm going to tell you how it was found. And we're going to talk about a few of the men that, are, that signed it, some of the first founding fathers. And then we're going to talk about why it was written. And hopefully when we're through, you'll get a good idea of what the Articles of Association is all about. First of all, the document itself was drafted in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on October the 20th of 1774 in Carpenter's Hall. And it was originally signed by 53 of the first founding fathers of our country. The document itself surfaced, the, at least the signature page, the fourth page, surfaced in 1978. There was a young man who was working in Knoxville, Tennessee, and he was an avid Historian. He was a local historian. And he was looking for a particular book, an antique book. And the book was called Lee and His Lieutenants, published by E.A. Pollard. And it was published in 1867. And he wanted the first edition copy of this book, and he had been looking for this book for four years. And so as he went into Knoxville, Tennessee that morning, he knew that there was an antique bookstore that was incredible just off the campus of the University of Tennessee. And so he called the owner to ask him if he had this incredible first edition book, 
And the owner said, you're not going to believe this, but we just got one in two days ago from an estate sale. And he said, if you really want this book, he said, I suggest you come down here quickly. I haven't looked at it, but I would like to sell it. And so he got in his automobile and he flew down to the bookstore. And as he was coming through the door, there it was on the counter. A beautiful, pristine edition of E.A. Pollard's book. And he opened the cover of the book to verify it was a first edition and then closed it. Neither the seller nor the owner had really looked at the book very closely. He paid the man $500 for Pollard's book and he walked out. He went back to work. And the next day, he drove home. He lived in Nashville. He lived actually above Nashville in Gulletsville, Tennessee. And on that Saturday morning, he sat down after breakfast and coffee to take a good look at this book that he had purchased. By the way, if you were to purchase that book today, it would be $5,000. But anyway, as he was looking at the book and flipping through the pages, suddenly a piece of linen parchment paper fell out on the floor. It had been folded up for many, many years. And he reached down and he unfolded carefully this piece of paper. And there were the signature of 53 men. He did not know what the document was, but it looked old. But he saw the signatures of George Washington and John Adams and Samuel Adams and Richard Henry Lee and John Jay who had signed the Declaration of Independence. And it really caused great excitement for him because he thought maybe this might be real. So he called his father, who was an administrator for Peabody College, a college in Nashville, and he took it over and let his father look at it. And his father looked at it and he didn't know what it was. And so both of them turned it over to Vanderbilt University and the history department to determine exactly what this man had found folded up in this antique book. And here are the results. That the document that they found was the fourth page of a four-page document written by the First Continental Congress called the Articles of Association. That the document itself in 1978 was over 203 years old. That the signatures, the pen signatures, on the last page of the document were real. Ladies and gentlemen, this man had found a national treasure of the United States of America. And there was a lot of excitement going on in Nashville, Tennessee at the time over this find. It was on TV. It was in the newspapers. It was covered heavily. And that went on for about a month and a half. And then suddenly it all died down. And this gentleman still owned this document. They determined that the first three pages had never surfaced, had never been found. They also noted that there was a copy in Washington that was called the Thomason copy. Charles Thomason was a secretary of the Congresses, and he elected to make a copy, but when it came to the pen signature, signatures on the last page, he just wrote the names in. This one are the individual signatures, the real ones. And so, this becomes one of four of the four national treasures of the United States of America. The very first one. And for the most part, it is, it is literally unknown. It was left out of your books. And that's why we're excited about having you here today and allowing you to see it. I brought with me three gentlemen, and I'd like to introduce them compatriot mate Matt Clark over here. Mac is helping me. Uh, compatriot Bob Anderson in uniform and compatriot Richard Wells who was in George Washington's uniform as he would have looked just before he was elected first president of the United States. So we have a document from 1774 and I brought two replicas of antique flags and I wanted to show you those. Bob if you would hold this one out. This is an unusual flag. This is called the flag of compromise. It was designed by Benjamin Franklin. This is the first flag of colonial America. The very first flag of colonial America. And if you take a look at it, it looks quite unusual. 
It doesn't have stars in the canton of the flag. It has 13 stripes. It was made in 1775. But look in the canton. In the canton of the flag is the flag of England. And that was our very first flag. Now here's the flag one year later. This is called the Betsy Ross flag. And if you'll notice something has happened. Look in the canton of the flag. In the canton, the British flag is now gone. What's there? 13 stars. stars. 13 stars. That's correct. 13 stars, 13 stripes, and this is the flag that we will go under during the American Revolution. Now there's a great painting that all of you have seen. It's in your textbooks, and it's George Washington crossing the Delaware. You've seen that painting, and he's in the barge, and behind him is the flag of America. The painting shows this flag, the flag of Betsy Ross, but it's the wrong flag. It didn't exist at the time Washington crossed the Delaware. This is the flag that should have flown in the barge. So there's a mistake in your textbooks when you look at this painting, and now you know what the real flag should look like. Well, now that you know how we found this and how it surfaced, I'd like to tell you a little bit about three or four of the men on here that signed it that generally are left out of your textbooks. And the first one I would like to talk about is the man right up here who signed his name at the top. His name is Peyton Randolph. He is from the colony of Virginia. Peyton Randolph in 1770s was the most popular man in America. If you lived in America at that time, you would have known this man. If he had turned out in your town, everyone in the town would have turned out to see him. He was incredible, incredibly respected. He's also the greatest legal mind in America at the time, Peyton Randolph. And he's elected from the colony of Virginia to come to the First Continental Congress. And he comes, and he is seated at the Congress. And the very first thing that the Continental Congress is going to do in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in Carpenter's Hall, is they're going to elect a president. And the first president that's going to be elected, the first president of colonial America, is going to be the Honorable Peyton Randolph from the colony of Virginia. And he's going to be elected unanimously because people know who he is and they trust him. By the way, the first person who will come up and address him as Mr. President and bow to him is a man by the name of George Washington. So that you're aware, there are 14 presidents of the Congresses before George Washington is elected the first president of the United States of America. And these are the men who led the country. And Peyton Randolph is the very first one. When he comes to the Congress, he's an old man. And he's in very bad health. He's very sick. He has, he's going to have a cerebral brain hemorrhage. And from the time he signs this document, one year later he will be dead. And when he dies of a cerebral brain hemorrhage, he will not be allowed to go home. You see, all of the men who signed this document, the Articles of Association, and the document called the Declaration of Independence, literally signed their lives away. Because they were put on a very special list by the British authorities. They were considered traitors. And if they were found, they were to be arrested, no trial, and hung as quickly as possible. So these men gave their lives for our country, and that's what's so incredible. Peyton Randolph can't go home, he's sick, but he will never see his family again. He can't go home and die, as was the custom. The British authorities are waiting on him. The second person that I would like to talk about is this gentleman up here from South Carolina. His name is Henry Middleton. 
When Peyton Randolph becomes sick and he can no longer sit in a chair, he has to leave the Congress. And Henry Middleton is elected from the colony of South Carolina to become the second president of the Congress. Now, Henry Middleton is not exactly like Peyton Randolph. Peyton Randolph is a patriot. He loves his country. He's never going to see the Declaration of Independence. And he's never going to see America free. He wants to, but he can't. Henry Middleton is, the wealth, is one of the wealthiest men in America at the time. He owns a fleet of ships in South Carolina. He has an import-export business. He is making money heads over heels in this trade. He is trading with England. And therefore, he is elected to come to the Second Continental Congress, and he will be elected the second president, and he will only serve four days. And then he will leave. He will be re-elected to the Second Continental Congress in 1775. But there's a problem with Mr. Middleton. He doesn't know whether he wants to be a patriot and love America, or whether he wants to be a loyalist and love the king. And to be quite honest, he's making too much money with England, and he decides not to come to the Second Continental Congress. He would rather be loyal to the king. And so he sends his son to take his place, Arthur Middleton. Arthur's not like his father. Arthur loves the country. He's willing to put his life on the line for the country. He signs the Declaration of Independence. Toward the end of the American Revolution, the British will invade Charleston, South Carolina, and they will take thousands of prisoners. And among the prisoners that they're going to take is going to be Henry Middleton and Arthur Middleton, his son. And they will let Henry go because he's been loyal to the king. And they will take his son and they will throw him in chains and they will take him down to St. Augustine, Florida and throw him in a dungeon called the Spanish Fort. And there he will rot throughout the American Revolution to be released after the war and his health is so bad that eventually in a short time he dies. A great American who gave his life for the country, who signed the Declaration of Independence that got left out of the books. Well, I'd like to tell you about one other man. A man that I think is the greatest patriot that ever lived in this country. Greater than Washington. Greater than Franklin. Greater than Jefferson. Greater than all of them. His name is Roger Sherman. I told you that Henry Middleton is one of the wealthiest in the country. Roger Sherman is one of the poorest. His father is a shoemaker. As a young child, he's not allowed to go to school to read and write. But he wants to go to school. And so he slips out and he learns how to read and write on his own. And then as a young man, he continues to read books. And the books get more complex. And then he loves to read law books. And eventually he takes the bar in Connecticut. And he becomes a lawyer. Not just any lawyer, the finest lawyer in Connecticut. And he is elected to come to the First Continental Congress and sign his name right here, Roger Sherman. And he comes to the Second Continental Congress. And he's put on the Committee of Five. And if you remember what the Committee of Five is, the Committee of Five is designed to write one of the most historic documents in our country, the Declaration of Independence. Standing beside Thomas Jefferson is Roger Sherman. And he helps write the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Fast forward, 1778, the Congress who will write the Articles of Confederation. Who's there? of all the founding fathers. Roger Sherman, he is the only one there from the original group. And he signs it. Fast forward, 1787, the Congress that will write the Constitution of the United States of America, the greatest document that we own. Who's there? Roger Sherman. Ladies and gentlemen, Roger Sherman is the only American in the history of the United States of America to sign all four major documents of our country, 
that make up the foundation of the United States of America as it stands today. These are incredible men who got left out of the books, and I wanted you to know about them. Now, I'd like to tell you why this was written. How many of you have studied the Boston Tea Party? Please raise your hand. Everybody has. Okay, here's basically what you got. 15 or 20 men, you know, some dress as Mohawk Indians, you know, taxation without representation, and they go down to the harbor, and there's three ships down there, and they begin to dump tea overboard. But that's not the real story. There's actually two Boston Tea Parties. They're 30 days apart. But the first Boston Tea Party is like this. There are about five or 6,000 people and they're around the Boston Meeting House and they're upset and they're angry and they're mad. They've been there for months. Soldiers are, are in their homes. They're being taxed to death. They're being treated as second class citizens and they're angry. And the British authorities come out of the building and this is what they tell them. Go home, we've had enough of you people. Go on home. You're not going to be treated as first class citizens. You're never going to get what you want. You're going to do what we tell you to do. You're going to pay the taxes and you're going to be loyal subjects. And there's a, there's a man standing on the hill with his men. His name is Samuel Adams. And he stands up to the British authorities and this is what he says. We've had enough of you people. We're not going to put up with this from you. You're going to treat us the way we need to be treated. We're first class citizens all the way. We're Americans. And I'll tell you what we're going to do to you. We're, there's three huge ships sitting down in the harbor and they're laden with tea from the East India Tea Company. We're going to go down there and have a party. We're going to destroy some tea. And so 1,200 of them leave and they head down toward the ships and they bring up barges and longboats alongside these ships and they began to unload 342 crates of tea. They have to use winch and tackle to get them into the longboats. And from that afternoon into the night, they're going to carry them out into the middle of the harbor and strategically drop them in certain places. You see, ladies and gentlemen, there is two channels that come into Boston Harbor. It is a premier harbor of America. This is the harbor where the huge vessels can come in. And as long as they stay on these channels, they can come in, unload, and go out. Our ancestors dropped the crates of tea into the channels of Boston Harbor. They blocked the shipping lanes. No ships could get out. No ships could get in. This is a major money maker for England. And it takes five weeks to get the word across the pond. And Parliament evokes the intolerable acts, the coercive acts, punitive measures put on the colony. And the word goes and spreads out across America that there's a national emergency. That if they can do that to Boston, they can do it anywhere. The Committee of 51 asked for a Congress, a representative form of government. And so they come. And they enact the Articles of Association. Fourteen articles in this. And this is what it says, very simply. It says, England, if you don't straighten up, if you don't give us our rights back, if you don't take the taxes off, if you don't remove the soldiers, if you don't stop arresting us without a trial, here's what we're prepared to, you, to do to you. On December the 1st of 1774, we're going to shut down every port on the eastern seaboard of America. You think Boston was something? Wait until we shut down everything. There will be no trade with you. We know your coffers are empty. We know you're hurting, and we know that the East India Tea Company is on the verge of bankruptcy. And England laughs at us, and we shut it down for 12 months. No trade. England comes back, and they're hurting, and this is what they say. We're sorry. We didn't mean it. We'll give you anything you want. Just open up your ports. Open up your ports and trade with us. And we do. Do you think they kept the promise? No. They didn't keep it. And so the Congress, de the Congress decides to write a document entitled The Cause and Necessity of Taking Up Arms in America. 
which leads to the Declaration of Independence, which leads to the American Revolution and war. And here's what you need to know. We won, they lost. That's what you really need to know. We won, they lost. <coughs> Toward the middle of the 19th century, just before the advent of civil war in America, the, the great question pondered by the leaders of the day was this. When did America begin? When did we first form a representative government which produces a republic, transforms itself into a democracy? When did it happen? Who's the 16th president of the United States? <coughs> Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln decides that he wants to answer the question. And so on March the 4th of 1861, he is going to answer the question to America of when we began, when we started. And he's going to do it in his inaugural address. And this is what he says. He takes the podium and he says, you know, the, <clears throat> we are much older than the United States Constitution. Much older. We actually began on October the 20th of 1774 with the Articles of Association of the First Continental Congress. He said it was matured by the, by the Declaration of Independence of 1776. He said it was further matured by the Articles of Confederation of 1778. And then he finally said, in 1787, one of the declared objects for ordaining, ordaining and establishing the Constitution of the United States was to form a more perfect union. And there it is. We have four major national treasures of our country. Articles of Association, Declaration of Independence, Articles of Confederation, and the United States Constitution. And ladies and gentlemen, today you're looking at the very first one. The very first one. It's an incredible literary artifact and it is your heritage. And eventually it will end up in Washington, D.C., and you will own it. But today, it's here at the University of the Cumberlands. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. I appreciate you being here. Hey, hey guys, listen, I want to make sure you understand something. You know, I show you in the classroom replicas of the Declaration and the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution because the originals are, you know, under lock and key, of course, up in Washington, D.C. This is real. What you're looking at is not, not a copy. This is a real document with real, real signatures of George Washington and other people that he just mentioned on there. And if you would... This is the, probably the closest you'll you, ever be. If you would come up very briefly, you can come up and sort of walk past it. Come on up real quick. Thank you.